Good evening, everyone. Uh, good to see all of you here. Uh, we've been, um, me and my wife and my daughter have been sick the last couple of Sundays, so we haven't been able to attend church. And we do appreciate all your prayers uh, for us and for me especially as I uh, preach God's word uh, this evening. Uh, I did want to make um, just one note. I, I really did appreciate Paul's message this morning. I felt, felt that it was very appropriate for the time that we live in and um, some things that really convicted myself. So thank you, Paul, for that. But I did have a problem with your introduction because um, I used to be a referee. Um, and my brother and my father are both referees now. And as you were giving that illustration, I was just having visions of people yelling at me. Um, and yet, you know, referees are people too. I just want you guys to know that. And don't forget one thing, a referee, no matter what call he makes, he's always wrong. <laughs> he's always wrong because the other team's always going to complain about the call. So uh, maybe that's why I'm not a referee anymore. Uh, anyway, um, please turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. We'll be reading the first 10 verses uh, of this chapter. Maybe, uh, Lord willing, next time I can finish uh, the text uh, because there's just so much in here that speaks about the glory of God. But um, we'll read the first 10 verses and go through that this evening. So let me read Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 through 10. <clears throat> now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw <clears throat> near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hittites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry, of, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptian, Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for this evening. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we come before your holy word, uh, we just pray, Father, for the help of the Holy Spirit uh, to come upon us and to uh, reveal to us uh, your glory, your majesty, your holiness, your love, your goodness to us. We pray, Father, that uh, in this time together in your word, uh, that it will penetrate our hearts and that we'll turn from our sins. And Lord, if there's anybody here this evening that does not know the true God, the one true God, that you would save them and reveal him to yourself and to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this all in Christ's name, amen. amen. Several years ago, uh, someone asked the late great theologian R.C. Sproul at the annual uh, Ligonier Conference that is held in Orlando uh, every year. Uh, during the Q&A uh, session, uh, this young man came up and asked this question. He said, what in your opinion is the greatest spiritual need in the world today? And without hesitation, Sproul replied, the greatest need in people's lives today is to discover the true identity of God. 
Then came this follow-up question that this young man asked. He said, okay then, so what is the greatest need or spiritual need in the lives of true believers in Christ and in the church? Again, without hesitation, Sproul replied, to discover the true identity of God. Because if believers really understand the character and the personality and the nature of God, it would revolutionize their lives. End quote. Now, I couldn't agree with Sproul's assessment anymore. And we think about this, and um, why is it, we ask these questions, why is it that so many churches today, worship seems so trivialized, so glib and so centered on entertainment? Um, there was a while back that I had just uh, went on YouTube, and I was just searching around different churches the way they did worship. And I came across one that was actually a local church here. And in the middle of the congregation, they proceeded to have Harry Potter night. And um, they were reading uh, the fourth installment, The Goblet of Fire, uh, actually in the pulpit. And there's no presence of God. There's no weightiness about the worship. Why is that? And why is evangelism so impotent and weak? in the lives of many self-proclaimed Christians today. I had just seen another video uh, recently where the, the writers of Babylon B, which is a Christian news uh, website that publishes satirical articles on all different types of topics. Uh, and they made an article about Elon Musk. And Elon Musk, if you, know, if you don't know, uh, he's the richest man in the world, CEO of Tesla and many other things. He replied to the Babylon B uh, and they got him to come to a podcast, invited him onto a podcast. So millions of people were watching this podcast with Elon Musk on there. And at the end of the interview, these men tried to share the gospel with him. And the best that they can do was they said, hey, Elon, you know we're Christians, and could you just do us a solid and, you know, ask Jesus in your heart? That was a golden opportunity and nothing but, hey, can you just say this real quick? You know, I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna bother you. And actually, if you look at the rest of the interview, it was about, um, that portion was about 15 minutes longer. He had all types of questions about Christ that they couldn't answer. So, you know, we ask these questions. Why is fellowship so shallow? among many Christians, and churches literally drying up across the country. And the answer to all of these questions is your ability to answer one simple question, who is God? What is the true identity of God? Now, if you have a shallow view of who God is, uh, as it's revealed in his word, then you'll have a shallow spiritual life, shallow worship, shallow fellowship, uh, a shallow godly life. Because if you can rightly answer this question and your main goal and aim purpose is to grow in a deeper, richer, fuller understanding of who God is through his word, through fellowship, through worship, through prayer, your life will have spiritual impact. There will be a saltiness and a brightness about your life. Your life will be countercultural and different from the world. Your life will have a radical flavor that will set you apart. So much different than what the world, what we see in the world today. And that's what I want from all of us who are believers today, this evening, for, for your life to have unbelievable impact for Christ and for the gospel in this present world. And why is that? Well, if you have a deeper, richer, fuller understanding of who God is, the way you view life will always be through the lens of God. His holiness, his love, all of his wrath, all of these different attributes and characteristics about him. So it's like Sproul said that discovering God's true identity will completely revolutionize your life. So this evening, I want us to consider a man who had somewhat of an impact for God the man they call Moses. Now Moses was used by God 
in an unbelievable way. Probably the most fundamental character in the Old Testament. But it was only until Moses knew who the Lord was that he was able to do great things for God. And Moses did know the Lord. But the question is how? How did Moses come to know the Lord? What things did he learn about God that completely revolutionized his life? The answer to this all-important question is found in Exodus 3, our narrative today. And here we'll read about a most famous encounter that Moses had with the living God at the burning bush. And there, Moses came face to face with God. And it was out of this encounter that Moses came to know God in a deeper, richer, fuller way, which gave him the confidence to be the deliverer of a nation. As you recall, a little bit of background, as you recall, Moses spent the first 40 years in his life in Pharaoh's court, raised in great privilege, great exposure to the pleasures of Egypt, right? He was a prince. He was honored as a man of great quality. But the scripture says that by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasuries in Egypt. Okay, so at 40 years of age, he left Pharaoh's court and he went to be with the people of Israel who were the slaves of Egypt at that time. Um, and then he was singled out in a most distinguished way. If we remember the account, he killed an Egyptian taskmaster for oppressing one of his brethren and he was banished from the land and spent the next 40 years in obscurity as a lowly shepherd. Okay. And it's in this lowly and humble state that Moses has this encounter with God. What he will learn in this encounter will, with God will mark his life and raise him up to be a spiritual leader for his people. So let's see what Moses learned in this encounter. And really what I want to put before you is four attributes or four characteristics about God that I want us just to consider, to meditate. Um, this is just putting God's glory on display tonight. That's what I seek to do. Okay, four attributes about God that I want us to consider this evening. Four truths that will help us to know about God in a deeper, richer way. So first truth, the first truth that we learn about God is God is the great pursuer of his people. God is the great pursuer of his people. Verse one, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Like we said before, or like I mentioned before, God was, I mean, Moses um, was in Egypt for 40 years, then exiled for 40 years. Moses is now 80 years old at the time of this account. For 40 years, he's dwelt in the land of Midian. Uh, Midian is actually 500 miles east of Egypt. Um, certainly within that time, he's had plenty of time to reflect uh, on his life, his past mistakes, uh, things that he might have done differently. Of course, um, the killing of the Egyptian, uh, which was morally wrong and rich, which was really the cause of his present circumstance. Uh, probably in his mind, Moses thought that this is where he was going to die, uh, with no great achievements, no great exploits, uh, just a lonely and humble shepherd uh, tending his father-in-law's flock. It's not, it wasn't even his flock. It's his father-in-law's flock. Not that that's bad to be working for your father-in-law, but... Um, okay. So the man who once revered in the courts of Pharaoh as a mighty prince was now an old man living out his years in exile. Yet God had different plans for Moses, right? He had been preparing this man. What he thought was maybe a life of little significance turned out to be the very thing he needed to perform this great task for God. For 40 years, the Lord sought to teach him humility, right? To be content with very little. He sought to teach him patience, 
which he would vitally need in the wilderness with four million people who were constantly complaining and grumbling. He had to learn to be content with very little. These things were all essential. And Moses had no idea that God was going to do this. For all he knew, he was going to die in this land. He had no idea that God was preparing him to be the great spiritual leader of the nation of Israel. And this should be a lesson for us. Whatever your lot is at this very moment in your life, whatever your circumstance is at this present time, it may seem that it has very little significance. Maybe it's where you work. Maybe you've been going to school for so long and you're not really doing much or whatever the case may be, it might not be what you have planned. And you may not understand everything God's doing, but whatever it is, don't miss on what God is seeking to teach you in this moment in your life. Because God doesn't waste anything. He never wastes experiences for his people. There's a purpose and a reason that he has you in the place that he does. Even now, as we speak, he's preparing you just as he did with Moses. Maybe not to lead an entire nation of people in the desert, but he has something planned for you, good works that he has planned for you that he's preparing you for. But even greater than that, the goal for your life and mine is to be formed more and more into the image of Christ. And that's God's ultimate aim, to prepare us for heaven, right? To prepare us for heaven. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is peripheral. He may be teaching you to be more content in him. He may be teaching you patience as you deal with certain trials or affliction in your life or maybe a position where you don't want to be in. He may be teaching you to trust him as you seek the next step in your life. You may not know what's ahead and you have to depend upon God and trust him more. But whatever it is, brethren, strive to be humble. Strive to humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Be content with your present circumstances for what they are and don't miss out on what God is teaching you, right? We could have taken COVID two years ago and said, why? You know, we're all sitting around and now look, our church is flourishing. We didn't know that. We didn't know what God had in, had in store, but God knows better than us and we need to trust him. Okay, so we continue in verse one. And he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now Horeb is Mount Sinai. Uh, Horeb is where Moses will return uh, in the future to receive the Ten Commandments. And Horeb, actually in the Hebrew, it means desolate. It means desolate. It's the idea of being in a place that's utterly forsaken. It's completely abandoned. Uh, that's where Moses is. He's in a desolate place. Uh, he's basically in the middle of nowhere, uh, leading these sheep to this mountain. Okay? And in this place, there were mountains and valleys, and the sheep would go and feed in these valleys where there were springs and vegetations, and that's why he's here. And God, um, in his providence, led him to this place. And in verse 2, we read that the angel of the Lord appeared to him. And I want you to notice who takes the initiative here. Moses is not searching for God. He's not looking for God. He's not seeking, oh, let me go in the back of this mountain and see if, if, if God's there. He's not searching for God. Nor is God patiently waiting for Moses to seek him first. No, it's God who appears to Moses. It's God who reveals himself to Moses in the midst of this bush. It's God who seeks Moses out. It's God who is the pursuer in this relationship. And this is an essential truth that we need to know, understand, and cherish about God, that in every true relationship, every true saving relationship between God and man, God is always the initiator. God is always first. He is always primary. Right? And why is this important? Because if we think, or if we think that it all revolves around us, 
and our will and our choosing, then our theology can become a more man-centered, right? Basically what we do instead of seeing the sovereignty of God in all things, even in our salvation, and appreciating his grace. In John 4, 23, Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. It doesn't say that the Father is waiting to, for such to worship him. This word seeking here means strongly desires, right? His heart is bent on it. He's seeking worshipers for himself. He's going out. He's initiating. And that's what we learn here. And this angel of the Lord who appears to him is none other than a theophany, as we were me mentioned uh, this morning in, um, in the worship. Uh, we were talking about Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? I'm glad I'm not leading that next week. Um, but the angel of the Lord here, it's a theophany. It's an appearance of God himself in the form of this angel. And this angel is with a capital A, not lowercase, okay? Uh, a capital A, meaning that he is the messenger of Jehovah, God himself. If you see a lowercase a by the angel of the Lord, then yes, it's a messenger, uh, it's an angel. This is God himself, okay? He's not a created angel, uh, for he expresses in verse 6, if you just scroll down a little bit, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, a created angel would never say that, ever. He would never put himself on par with God, okay? Never. It was this, the, um, it was this same angel of the Lord that appeared to Abraham at Mount Moriah as he offered up Isaac on the altar. It's the same angel of the Lord who appeared to Jacob in a dream, uh, he's the one who leads the Israelites uh, by a pillar of cloud by day and, uh, and um, a pillar of fire by night. Uh, he reveals himself to Samson and to Gideon and to David. Uh, this angel of the Lord is none other than Yahweh himself. It is Jehovah God. Now, many divines in the history of the church have believed this to be the pre-incarnate uh, pre Christ himself, the second person of the Trinity. Um, and I believe with that um, assessment of this, I believe it's the Lord Jesus. I believe it's God the Son. Now, I won't go into all of that because that's a whole separate sermon, but um, take that for what you will. And so we see that God is taking the initiative here. And somebody might argue at this point, well, didn't I have part in finding God? Didn't I seek after him? Didn't I choose to read the Bible and go to church and uh, to, put faith, to have faith in him and I made a profession of faith in Christ? Didn't I choose him out of my own free will? And my answer would be, my friend, your will was in spiritual bondage and you were spiritually dead in your sins before God came and brought you to himself. It's all of God. It's all of grace. It is a gift. Nothing that we did. The reality is that you would have never chose him if he didn't choose you first. Okay, the only reason why you had any desire to do those things is because God was already working in you, wooing you by his spirit. And at the fulfillment of time, at the appropriate time, and by his sovereign grace, he changed your heart from stone to a heart of flesh. You had a stubborn heart, a, 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 heart a, a, a rock of heart that would not worship God, did not want to worship God, did not want to read the word, did not want to go to church, had nothing to do with Christ. Then he reached down and changed your heart, it changed your desires. That's true conversion. And that's sovereign grace. God is the initiator of all of this. He's the initiator of the pursuit of his people. It's God who found you. And tonight, if you're a Christian, I will remind you that it's God who pursued you and sought you and had pity on you while we were enemies of him. 
while we were helpless, he came down and said, you, you I want. We're pursuing you. I want to save you. God is the great pursuer of his people. Let us always pr- appreciate his grace, his sovereign grace, his love for us. His, he set his special love upon us. Uh, what a glorious God that we do serve. For it was Jesus who proclaimed after the conversion of Zacchaeus, that wretched man that stole money from so many of his brethren. He says, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Praise his holy name. He's a seeking God. But not only is he the great pursuer of his people, but secondly, he's an all-sufficient source of strength for his people. An all-sufficient source of strength for his people. We continue to read in verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. God was in this bush in the form of a raging, blazing fire. Uh, the term, the Hebrew term for this word bush here is sana. It, it kind of draws to speak about a small shrub or bush. It wasn't like a tree, like you see in the Ten Commandments movie. I feel like some of that stuff is a little exaggerated. It was a small bush. But the amazing thing here is what the writer points out is that this bush was burning yet... Uh, with fire, yet it was not consumed, right? Instead of burning up, it just kept burning on and on. Like when we go on the camping trip and we have to put, you know, we're, we want to heat up after it's, it's cold out and we just start throwing logs on that fire. But this, this fire didn't need no wood, didn't need any gasoline. It just kept going and going. God is a consuming fire. Dr. Stephen Lawson comments on this verse. He said, the fire was a self sustaining fire that was dependent upon no outside agent. The only thing that was keeping the fire going was the one who was in the fire itself. Of course, this was all to reveal, for God to reveal to Moses that he is the infinite, eternal, self-sufficient God who is dependent upon no one or nothing else but Rather, everything is dependent upon him. Everything depends upon him. Why? Because he's the source of all life. He's the source of all life. God is sufficient enough to be called the great I am. He reveals this to Moses later on in the narrative. His name is I am, not I need or I want or I wish, not for a little while, Not maybe one day. God just is. Past, present, and future. John MacArthur comments here. He says, the reality is God does not need us. God does not rely upon us. God is without beginning or end. God is forever and always perpetual, ceaseless, and enduring. And this is what was conveyed to Moses. This is what he wanted to show Moses. And why was this important? Why was this important for Moses to know? How does God revealing himself as an ever-blazing fire in a bush help Moses for the task ahead? Well, the answer is simply because God is about to call him to do the impossible. To go to Pharaoh And to stand before him and to demand to let his people go, to let the Israelites go, to be in battle with the servants of Pharaoh, and to lead four million people through the wilderness, through danger, through hunger, through strife, in order to lead them to the promised land, to be God's mouthpiece to his people, to be his mediator between God and man. Could you imagine the responsibility that was placed before Moses? Called to be a spiritual leader of an entire nation? And Moses expresses later on in the text of his utter inadequacy, right? Of his weakness, his actual fear before such a monumental task. Who am I, he says, that I should go to Pharaoh 
and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Who am I? And then he says again, O my Lord, I am not eloquent. Neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And again, finally, Lord, send somebody else. Anyone, don't send me. I am utterly inadequate for this. So as Moses looked inward into himself, he realized that this was utterly impossible. Who is sufficient for these things? As Paul would say, how could I possibly do what God is calling me to do? And the answer is found in the burning bush. Only God is sufficient for these things, brethren. Only God is sufficient. With God, all things are possible. He is the sustainer of all life and everything from the smallest molecule to the largest star dependent upon him. He is the source of infinite grace and power. He is the everlasting fountain that never dries up. He is the reservoir of never-ending supply of strength that is given to his people on their need. Right? The Lord says, I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens for animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world is mine and all that is in it. What was God's response to Moses' constant complaints of inadequacy? Don't worry, Moses. I believe in you. And if you just believe in yourself, you can do anything. (laughs) That's depressing. No. What does he tell him? He tells him, certainly, I will be with you. Certainly, I will be with you. Yes, by yourself, Moses, You are surely inadequate for this task. But I will be there with you to sustain you, to strengthen you, to counsel you, to be there by your side on this great endeavor. Brethren, didn't Jesus tell us the same exact thing? Right? In Moses 28, or in Moses, in Matthew 28, 20, when he calls the disciples to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing him in the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, who is sufficient for these things. What does Jesus tell him? What does he tell them? Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It's good to be reminded of this, brethren, because sometimes we forget how amazing and awesome God is. But not only how great he is, but that he's, 100% for us. He's for us. Unconditionally. Without reservations. And why? Because he's 100% unconditionally for his son. And anybody that's in the son, he loves just like a son. Unconditionally. Paul states this same truth in Ephesians 3.20. He says, For he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So no matter how, how great the demand will be upon you and upon your life, no matter how dark the night may seem right now, or how great the challenge is before you, God is yet greater. And God has a never-ending supply of all that you need to accomplish the work that he has for you to do. And the promise that he gave to Moses, he gives to you. He says to Moses, do not fear, don't worry. Certainly, I will be with you. He's the great sustainer. He's sufficient for anything that he calls us to do. So third, third truth So we see that God is a pursuing God and that God is an all-sufficient God. But third, I want you to note that God is a holy God. God is a holy God. In verse 3, Moses says, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. Right, so verse 4, so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and says, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. 
Notice Moses' response. That's how we should respond when God calls us. Here I am. What do you need from me? Anything. What do you need from me? The humility. But God's warning him here in verse 5. He says, do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. To remove one's sandals was a very common demonstration in the ancient world of showing respect, showing reverence, uh, submission. Uh, Obviously, many Asian cultures still practice this. Uh, It's recognition of one entering into a very special place. So God tells Moses to remove your sandals for the place you're standing is holy ground. Wherever God is, is holy ground. This is holy ground where we are right now. God's presence is among us. How important it is to be in reverence as we worship the one true God in his house. We are in holy, holy ground. And it wasn't holy because there were special minerals in the ground or because the land was uh, especially fertile in that location. Uh, remember, this place is called desolate. There's nothing special about this place at all. It's amazing that God would choose this place to reveal himself. But yet this becomes the most sacred and special place in all of the earth because God is there. God is present. The word holy means to be set apart from the common and the mundane. It carries the idea of a separation or to cut, to be set apart from which is earthly to that which is heavenly and divine. Uh, Dr. Stephen Lawson comments again here. He says, this piece of dirt now becomes holy because it becomes a theater for God's glory to now be put on display before the soul of Moses. So what do we mean by God's holiness? By this, we mean that God is set apart from his creation and that there is an infinite chasm between him and every other thing. He's more valuable, more majestic, more glorious than the whole universe combined. That's how great he is. It means that God is transcendent and exalted above anything else. It means that God is in a category all by himself. Like people say God and country. Don't say God and country. Don't ever put God with anything else. I know that's a saying that people like to say, but my point is there's no God and it's just God. It means that God is perfect and morally pure. It speaks of his hatred for all sin and his love for all that is good. A couple of corresponding verses here. It says 1 Samuel 2.2, 2, there is none like, there's none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Exodus 15.1, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Revelation 15.4, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. God's holiness requires everyone, all nations, who will come in his presence to forever always remove the sandals from their feet. It means that we must always lower ourselves before him and to always reverence his glory, to submit ourselves to him. In verse 6, God said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. In other words, if there's any other misunderstandings of who's speaking to Moses, God identifies himself now as the God of history, the God of the covenant, the God that worked in the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, leading to this present moment in time. Then later on it says, then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Such is the trauma whenever the creature comes into the presence of the creator. 
We see a perfect example of this in Isaiah's vision of the Lord. I know uh, Pastor Paul uh, mentioned uh, this text in, in particular in his sermon today, where even the holy angels cover their eyes in humility before God's holiness. And we read in, in Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and, on, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wing, wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. God is so holy, so pure, so glorious that the holy angels can't even bear to look at his face in his presence. They cover their face. Now, if an angel were right here next to me, everybody would be tempted to worship. That's how beautiful and glorious the angels are. Now put that in comparison to the holy God. They can't even look at his face. They cover their eyes in humility. And Isaiah yells out, woe is me. I am completely undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Anytime man sees God for who he truly is, anytime he gets a glimpse of his holiness, this is always the reaction. Man falls on his face. I think John Calvin uh, said it best in his Institutes. Uh, volume one uh, had such a tremendous impact upon uh, my life uh, because I, I don't think they're, he's definitely in the top five theologians of just his idea and his view of the holiness of God. He says this, he says, hence that dread, and he's talking about the holiness of God here and the contact of man. He says, hence that dread and wonder with which scripture commonly represents the saints as stricken and overcome whenever they felt the presence of God. Thus, it comes about that we see men who in his absence normally remain firm and constant, but who, when he manifests his glory, are so shaken and struck dumb as to be held low by the dread of death, are in fact overwhelmed by it and almost annihilated. As a consequence, we must infer that man is never sufficiently touched and effect by the awareness of his lowly state until he has compared himself with God's majesty, end quote. When was the last time you hid your face before God? When was the last time I hid myself, hid my face before God? Because you sense the awesomeness of God. The fact that God is a consuming fire that God is so transcendent and different from us, so exalted. Whenever the last time you saw God that way is the last time you feared the Lord. There is a story that John MacArthur likes to tell about the man who claimed that he saw um, God appear to him in, in his bathroom while he was shaving. And, um, and the man said to John MacArthur, God appeared to me and, and spoke to me. And John MacArthur said, uh, did you keep shaving? And the man said, yes. And MacArthur said, then it wasn't God. For, it would, <laughs> for if it was God who appeared in your bathroom, you would have fell in the bathtub. And Moses needs to have this impressed upon his mind and upon his heart. If he was going to be God's mediator to his people, he needed to know who God was. And most importantly, he needed to know that God is holy. He needed to have a sense of his own sinfulness and lowliness. He needed to be humbled before him. Because God will never use anybody who's glib toward him. He'll never use anybody who's fueled 
by their own pride and and self-worth, seeking to glorify themselves. And if our lives are to have any spiritual impact, brethren, if our ministries are going to be blessed by the Lord, if our lives are going to be glorifying to God, this truth must be impressed upon our souls. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we never outgrow that. We never outgrow seeking to grow more in the knowledge of who he is and fearing him. And he says, for you shall be holy, for I am holy. So this leads us finally for our last point. Moses needed to see not not only God is a holy God, but that this God is a saving God. This God is a saving God. This God who's set apart and also a God of greatest love and deepest mercy towards his people, he desires to deliver them. Notice verse seven, the Lord says, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Would you note that this God that is so glorious, that's so high and exalted above, he says, surely I have seen. Surely I have seen. He's not indifferent towards us. He's not a distant and far off God. He's not so high and lifted up that he doesn't care about the concerns and the circumstances of his people. Surely I have seen their oppression. You see, he's afflicted. He's afflicted with our afflictions. He feels, he cares, he's concerned. He says, I've heard their cry. I know their sorrows. This God sees and knows and feels and cares for his people. God is well aware of their trials and suffering and he's well aware of your afflictions. He's well well aware of your afflictions, whether they're physical or spiritual He knows them all, and he cares. I I think of what Jesus says in in Matthew 10, verse 29. He says, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Right? God sees the very hairs. He knows the very hairs upon our head, and he knows even when a sparrow falls, how much more does he care for us? How much more does he care for us if he cares for a little sparrow? And will Moses need to know this? Absolutely. For the task that God has called him to will be the most demanding task of his life. Moses will need to know that God sees and cares and is concerned, but not only him, but for his people. And in verse 8, God says, So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Note this, when God does something extraordinary, it always says when God comes down. Okay? When it says God's coming down, something amazing is about to happen. When God seeks to intervene and step into a situation, he comes down. Take, for instance, the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. Most of you know the account. Nimrod and all the men of all the earth. Uh, They're building that great city, that great tower uh, to reach heaven itself. They sought to make their own stairway to heaven. The problem is they, they, they wanted to make it without God. They wanted to make it a godless society. And everybody was in on it. Everybody was speaking the same language. Everybody was building and they couldn't wait to make this stairway to heaven so that we could just worship man for how great he is. And it says what? God came down. He said, okay, we have to stop this right now. And what did he do? He struck the people by confusing their language. Scattered man all over the face of the earth. Pretty amazing. And the same thing's happening here. God is coming down to deliver them from the Egyptians. The time has now come for God to step into the situation, for God to invade history, Uh, for God to act and deliver, as it says. Uh, This deliverance will be the dramatic rescue of God's people out of Egyptian bondage. And he says now, he wants to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land. 
Notice, he only, notice that God doesn't only save them from the negative, but he transfers them into the positive, right? He transfers them into the positive. Not only does he save them out of Egypt, but he brings them into Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. Isn't this a perfect example of the gospel? How God not only saves us from our sins, from our wretchedness, but also he transfers us as sons and daughters of him who will inherit eternal life, that eternal resting place. I mean, this whole narrative is filled with types of Christ and types of what, what Christians are about to experience. The spiritual, the, the bondage of the Egyptians correlates with our spiritual bondage. All of it. In verse 9, he says, Now there be, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. God repeats himself, right? He said the same thing in verse 7. Uh, this is the only time he repeats himself in this entire passage, except for when he says, Moses, Moses. Okay? He's emphasizing how in touch he is with his people, how much he cares for his people. Therefore, uh, verse 10, it says, Come now, I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. This is the heart of God, brethren. This is the heart of God. It's the heart of God to save his people out of their affliction. Moses would learn this when they stood at the Red Sea, right? He held up the rod of the Lord and he said, behold the salvation of the Lord. Jonah learned this in the belly of the fish when he said in Jonah 2.9, salvation is of the Lord. And in Daniel 3.17, when, we, when Pastor Smith spoke about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were thrown into the fiery furnace. They said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us out of the fiery furnace. But more than rescuing his people out of the fiery furnace for a season, which you may be going through right now. There may be people here, certainly are, that are going through affliction, that are going through suffering and trials. But more than that, he will be a comfort to you there. But more than that, he delights in saving his people out of a fiery hell for all of eternity. More than delivering his people out of the belly of a fish, he desires to save his people from the belly of hell. And I say that severely because I want us to love God. And we can only love God so much so that we know how much we've been forgiven and what the consequences of what he saved us from. We all had marks marching. If God didn't seek us, if God didn't care for our afflictions, we'd been heading straight to hell. God says to the nations in Isaiah 45, 22, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is no other. There is no other savior that can rescue us from our sin. Isaiah 43, 11, I, even I am the Lord and there is no savior beside me. I am the one who wipes out your transgressions. I will not remember your sins. And I think of Peter when he stood before the Sanhedrin and he said, there is salvation in no other name for there is no other name in heaven or under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Right? When Jesus was born, the angel announced, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Okay, so what do we learn here? God is a saving God. God came down and rescued the Egyptians out of bondage, out of slavery. Right? He, he brought them into the promised land. He parted the Red Sea. He brought them in the wilderness for 40 years. He used Moses in an amazing way. God came down and delivered his people, worked the mighty plagues. But there was another time where God came down. In the future, many years in the future where God would come down again, but he wouldn't come down in the form of miracles and plagues and all sorts of supernatural things. He came down in the person of his son. He came down in the person of his son to save us 
from spiritual bondage, to save us from our sins. And what did he have to do? He had to go to the cross. He had to be humiliated, offered up as a sacrifice to pay the ultimate price for us so that we could be set free. It was a spiritual exodus, as they say, a spiritual exodus where he led his people, led his people free. So he's the God. So who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? What do we learn? Well, he's the God who hears our cries when we're afflicted. He is the God who knows our circumstances and desires to be that ever source of help for us as we call upon him. He is the God of infinite grace who pursues his people despite their sinfulness, despite their condition. He is the God who is the all-sufficient one, who promises to be your strength and comfort through the trials of life. He is the God who's holy and majestic and transcendent, who is separated above everything else. And he's the God who is called Savior. And we see that most predominantly in the person of his son, who said, I am the door. If anybody enters by me, he will be saved and, go, and will go in and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And again, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life life a ransom for many for everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame for there is no distinction between Jew or Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all bestowing his riches on all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved God is an amazing savior he's an amazing God thanks be to God for his grace in all of our lives Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we again pray, um, Lord, that, we would, that you would help us to see, see your glory in all of these things, that uh, we would strive to grow in our understanding of you, strive in having a deeper and more intimate relationship with you, that we would grow, grow in holiness and and that we would see these things and savor them and cherish them, that it would be the main goal of our life to search the riches and seek out the riches of who you are and of who your son is. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to grow in holiness and godliness through your word. And I pray that if anybody's here this evening that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would bring them to yourself, that you would seek them, that you would be the pursuer and reach down and change their heart from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. For you seek such to worship you, Lord. You seek all to worship you. I pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.